tuned for The Joan Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview, the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Waiting to be profiled is Alex Dallas and artist Yoshio Ikazaki. Actor, writer, Alice da Alex Dallas. It's very hard, Alice Dallas. Maybe we should change your name. <laughs> <laughs> Alex Dallas was born in Belgium, raised in London, and at the age of 15, something happened to you that became the subject of a play you wrote. Yes, it was quite an interesting adolescence. Yes. <laughs> adolescence is usually hell for most people, but at the tender age of 15, I discovered rather unfortunately that the man I thought that I'd grown up in the house with and thought was my father was not in fact my father at all. So I discover that my father is actually a completely different person from a completely different part of the world. Somebody who I vaguely know on the periphery of our life and the whole experience was so fascinating to me that when I had to write sit and write a one-woman show that's what came out. I didn't mean to write that show it just poured out. You really had met him? I'd, I'd met him, sometime? yes, and I'd been introduced to him. Was that your, his name that you have? No. Oh, no. because you, you said it was a Greek Cypriot, yes. and Dallas is a yeah. Greek name, or yes. it would be a yes. Greek name. Yes, no. Or it could be a Greek That's name. That's right, but <laughs> Dallas is actually my other father's name. It's Scottish. <laughs> oh, is that right? House by the Dale. It's a wee village just outside of Aberdeen. <laughs> so different. I know. Fascinating, oh. isn't it? Were you trained in the theatre? Not really. I, I desperately wanted to be an actress, and I asked if I could oh. go to theatre school, and they sort of went... No, that's not very sensible, go and be a teacher. Oh, is that? Oh. So I, what I was actually trained in was drama teaching. Oh, you were? And I did teach. So you did take some drama yeah, classes yeah. along the way. Yeah, but then when I Why'd that, you write the one-woman show then? Ah, well, here's the rub. I was in a female comedy troupe called Sensible Footwear. Oh, yeah, I love that title. Yeah. Sensible, sensible Footwear. Footwear. See how sensible they are yes, today? Uh -huh. um, for 18 years. So is for 18 that? years, I worked with these two other women and we had a fabulous career and we toured Britain and eventually we found ourselves in Canada and eventually we actually moved to Canada, the whole troupe, the business. Oh. And um, eventually I had to start writing a solo show because we all started having babies and we couldn't take all the babies on tour all the time. I see, so <laughs> you were playing Fringe, Fringe right. festivals. Yeah, what is sorts. a Fringe festival? The Fringe festival is a fantastic thing that I adore and it's based on the Edinburgh Fringe Festival, which first happened about 50 years ago. That's the granddaddy of Fringe Festivals, yeah, right? that's absolutely it. And what happened was they had an Edinburgh Festival that was full of classical music and, you know, the mainstream arts, and they had a Fringe Festival to the side where you could come and do all sorts of interesting, eclectic, oh. weirdo, experimental, fringy stuff. Like a shadow conference. Yes. Like a, yeah, yeah, I so see. So we were on the side, and then the Fringe Festival got bigger, 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 and now it's a four-week fantastic festival in Edinburgh every year. But what about regular theatre? Because you're performing, you perform in regular theatres, you also perform in fringe festivals. Yeah. Are they also regular theatres? Regular? No. Uh, oh, they're if not. you're in a fringe festival, you often get given a very small black room <laughs> with no air conditioning in the height of summer. But not outside <laughs> in the open. No, I have done that, but I don't do that anymore. I that see. Too much like <laughs> Oh, but you do have a, a room Yes, you with fold-out chairs? Yes, fold-out chairs. The <laughs> audience are like, oh, we're going to expire from heat. Um, but it's the bravest theatre you'll see. Like, you pay around eight bucks for a ticket, and out of 150 shows, you might see two that are brilliant, two that stink, and a lot of very interesting work in between. Oh, I see, I see. And it's taking a risk as an audience member is not that great for eight bucks, is it? No, but then as far as the venue goes, then you would be in a regular theater, but isn't that more comfortable? You have lighting, you have air conditioning, you have regular theater seats. It is, but it's, um, it's the camaraderie. It's like running away to the circus. You get to run away with all these artists, mm -hmm. and the Fringe Tour in Canada goes right across the country for the whole of this summer. So, I don't know, it's, 
it's a bit of a lonely life sometimes just being on the road by yourself that's why i'm attracted to it and i can see up <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and as you know, I'm very, very attracted to performers and entertainers. I they know, say it's this, shameful. This one play that you did, Nymphomania, yes. um, at the Stella Adler Theatre in Hollywood, debuted there. Yes, uh, has played all across Canada, yep. and I understand that in five minutes it's sold out. Yep. My reputation Every, precedes me, Joan. Ha, well, are they little tiny houses? <laughs> <laughs> they're fairly small. They're 100, 150. But still, they're but clamoring the is, to they're get... They're clamoring, yeah. And that, I think that's from 10 years of building up an audience on the uh -huh. circuit and everybody knows who I am. But I'm, I have to say I'm particularly thrilled with this show because it's gone over so well everywhere I've been. And I don't know why, but it's just speaking to people. And all it is is my real life. As you know, you've seen it. I've seen it, and I saw it. <laughs> and I wondered what nymphomania was to you. Well, to me, as I say in the end of my show, I give my own definition because I've talked about the Oxford English Dictionary definition. Yeah, which is what? Give, which give is, both um, of them. <laughs> well, the Oxford Dictionary says nymphomania is excessive sexual desire in women. And a nymphomaniac is a woman who suffers from nymphomania. <laughs> And of course, I say in my show, <laughs> boy, do I suffer. <laughs> exactly. It's a tragedy, really. And then you go uh, through. Then we go through my whole life, my experiences, my marriages, my um, child being born, and all sorts of things that happened to me, all my encounters, brush, brushes with fame. Is it true? Is it all true? All absolutely true. And, if it, and are you directed by someone? I am. I'm directed by the fantastic Carolyn Hay, who is from Toronto, Canada, and who um, is a Second City alumni. Well, I don't know if you know about Second City, but it's all these fantastic people, many of whom are very famous here in L.A. now, all the Mike Myers and Martin Shorts and all these fantastic All the names you love to things. drop. I know, I love that. <laughs> you love I love drop. that. I love it. It's my favourite. <laughs> I come to LA and I haven't seen a star. So did Tell me where to you go. You haven't? No, where are they? Oh my goodness, they're everywhere. <laughs> you just walk <laughs> out in the corner and they're there. Not yet. Go to the market. You haven't gone to the market no, yet. No. Okay, well, as soon as you start going to the market, okay. you'll see them go to the Rite Aid, go anywhere where normal people go. Okay. Okay, don't go looking on Hollywood Boulevard. No. <laughs> <laughs> now, what were we talking about? Nymphomania. My name dropping. Carolyn. Yes. Carolyn Hay. Carolyn Hay, who had to work with the material that you had. Did she try to rewrite it, rearrange it? She dramaturged it in that sort of way, in the fact that we did, you know, edits and edits and oh, edits. And I we, wondered, does yeah. she write it with you or no, do you write I it? I write it entirely and then we sit on the floor and we literally put the, all the sketches out on the floor and we literally get on our hands and knees and move them around move them around and get like sort of into it and get scissors and get red pens oh you do because it's a brutal process because you, know. you mix the poignant with the I comedy know. isn't that lovely i love that you see that's what i want to see when i go to the theater i want to laugh and i want to cry i want to be provoked and i want to think and i want to be moved and so is that what you're doing when you're on the floor, yeah, moving things around? This is going to grab the audience and this will... Because yeah. I wondered how one yeah. person... The other thing that I really noticed that was very strong was the cadence of your voice. It changes yes. all through. Yes. Sometimes you sound like Adina from Ab Fab. That's right. I know. Is that right? Is it, I am I, did I pick it up? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't do it on purpose. Sometimes I'm terribly, terribly deep. Yes. Sometimes I'm very English, you're never so high, and then everything in between. But that's fun too, because when you're just on stage by yourself, you don't want to sort of end up in just one continuous drone so that people so does that what nod off. <laughs> is that what your director does? Because some, some things were very poetic, the way you said them. Yes. Th that's yeah. where I saw the ups and downs in your... Yeah. Well, I think we're, we're so much on the same wavelength about that sort of stuff. With, with your director? With each other, that we really do want it to be hilarious well, here and moving there. Could you do it yourself? No, I don't think so. Oh. I really, really usually tell actors you need a director. I, I just think you need somebody that's so out of side of yourself. I, I think I would make a terrible botch of it. It would never be anywhere near the show it is without Carolyn's input. Do you Definitely. use a different, like when you're traveling in Canada, do you use a different director? I've worked with one other woman, yeah. Oh. But Carolyn and I seem to be the combination. We're the winning combination. Oh, so we've got it here. <laughs> yes, At absolutely. the Stella Adler Theatre, right? right. Yeah. And d does, does playing in Hollywood open your eyes because you talk, you name drop during the whole thing. I know. People ask me if I'd written it especially for LA and I said no. You do, that, you do that everywhere. I do that everywhere. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> Tell us a little bit about it. Um, I love the Jack Nicholson story. Well, this is all true as well, you see, that I met Mr. Nicholson backstage in about 1978 and had a little interesting interlude with him. And I'll just leave it at that for the viewers so they don't, so they get provoked. <laughs> no, you were the nymphomaniac and he's the one who's always chasing women. Yeah, well, but he didn't chase me. Mm. I was terribly hurt. What other names did you drop? Oh, Sting, Elton John, Rob Lowe, Eddie Izzard, Michael Palin. Did you ever... Okay, this is my best name drop. You want to hear my best name drop? Okay, Who yes. came to my show in Vancouver? Oh, yes, this is good. Sir Ian McKellen. I know, and he wanted to be put on stage, right? Yes. You want to tell us what he said? Well, he <laughs> enjoyed the show. My very good friend, Alan Cumming, who so I saw brilliant. in the Edinburgh Fringe in 1982. Is that right? And became friends with him, and he's the only person I've ever met or seen on stage where I went, you are going to be a superstar. I've never seen such talent oozing out of a person. Just what I said when I saw him on Broadway, I went, you can't, this guy mesmerizes you. You can't yes, take your eyes no, off of him. That's right. He's and fantastic. you knew that way back then? Yeah. So I saw him when he was 18 years old. Anyway, he brought Sir Ian McKellen to the show because they were filming in Vancouver. And uh, they both clamored to be in my list of famous men. <laughs> and I was very touched. And <laughs> So Ian gave me a big kiss and he said, thank you for making me laugh and thank you for making me think. And that's entirely what I want my show to do to people. So I'm like, I love you. And you, you're, because he <laughs> understood you. Yes, he well, got we it. understood you too. Yes. You talk about your American daughter. You're so British, you're so Canadian and, and you have this American daughter. Yes, yes this Who has gorgeous. a great name. <laughs> yes, Ruby Dallas, um, who has, by the way, I can't even believe this, just landed her first commercial yesterday. Oh, are you a I'm pushy like, mother? Uh, no, I am not a pushy mother. I'll let her do it while she's happy, wants to do it, but I'm not like, I, I don't suggest this, although it's a good way for saving for the college fund. If she works in Hollywood, will you stay here? Oh, I can't imagine that I would ever let her work in Hollywood. Oh, she wouldn't be no. doing this work there? <laughs> oh. No, no, no. She's staying at school. She's doing her French education. And so you're going back yeah. to Toronto. Oh, absolutely. And we're, we only yeah. have you here for a little while. Yeah. But I would love to come back. It's just been such a great experience. I would love to come back. How does it feel to play, just before we leave, to an American audience as opposed to the Canadian audiences? Well, I wondered that about that. I was slightly scared. I thought, oh, I wonder if they'll get me. But actually, no difference. Really? In fact, just as warm and lovely and people love it. I mean, yeah, I, I put in a few little references, especially because we were in L.A. Right. Uh, but otherwise, I think we're all living. The issues in my show are the issues of living and particularly from a woman's point of view. But just they're just about humanity. They're just about love and relationships and birth and death. They're just the things that stuff is life is made of. And I think everyone can relate to it. Would you call it a woman's show? I think women have a really good time, <laughs> but actually I think men do too. I, I heard did. quite a lot of male <laughs> laughter in that audience. Well, you know why? Because yeah. they hear you admitting things that yes. they know really are true, but no one will admit it, and yes. you're admitting it on stage. This is the whole point, I think. This show is incredibly honest. There's no pretension to it. I'm only myself, and I'm just telling you my story, and if you can take something away f from that story that you can relate to, that's fantastic. I've done my job. And well, That's thank great. you. Thank you. Thank you, Alex Dallas. Thanks. And thanks for being here. And don't go away. We'll be right back with Yoshio Ikazaki, whose art is on the set. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome back. Artist Yoshio Ikazaki. I'm having such a hard time with that name. <laughs> Ikazaki was born on an outer Japanese island. But he earned a Bachelor of Arts and a Master's from Florida State in painting. Soon after several years, you studied um, paper making with yes. a paper master, mm -hmm. Matsuo. Right. Why did you go into paper making? Well, um, actually, after I finished my master's degrees, I had the choice to really stay in the States to continue my uh, art activities, or I've always wanted to make 
paper for my own paintings. Ah. So that's, you know, one of the strong reasons that I go, went back to Japan to study. Was he a national treasure? Well, he's not national treasure, but at that time he was the vice president of the uh, uh, Japanese handmaking unions. Do they have a, a national treasure in paper making? Um, yes. They, uh, they must. <laughs> yes. We have one person uh -huh. um, currently, yes. But and he, he probably studied, taught everyone that you know? Um, not really that I know, but um, yeah, it's very difficult. Um, it's very unusual for them to to teach somebody food from outside, oh. because paper making business is more like a family oriented business in Japan, oh. and uh, maybe they are the I'm the first person accepted me from the outside as the the apprentice. Why know. were you c considered the outside? You were born in Japan just yes. because you went to school in the uh, States? Oh, not necessarily. It just um, th this is sort of a Japanese tradition that if you're born to be a son of paper maker, oh. you, you, have you become to paper makers, oh, yeah. I but see, uh, I see. somebody who have totally different background want to study papers and they didn't know what was so the purpose that I was you know interested in so what was the procedure mm -hmm. did you have to apply to him or well I sent a letter saying that uh, I'm interested in studying paper from you and uh, I didn't get any answers oh. <laughs> so I had to sort of uh, you know reply again then I have to wait like three months and finally I realized that maybe he's not going to maybe send me the letter, so I have to go there to knock his own door. Oh. Um, yes. And it, show him that you really wanted it. Exactly. <laughs> I have to show my passion, you know. <laughs> and that's what you did? Yeah, that's what I did, yes. How long were you studying? Um, I studied totally six and a half years with them. Is that right? Yes. Well, first I didn't realize that how long to take to study and understand the process of making papers, but uh, when I actually involved, it was just two sort of uh, um, difficult things that it, it learning in a short period of time. So first couple years were just me to see what they're doing and then like actually third year, I'd be able to, or they permit me to really you know, Get, be a part of it? Right. Really? Mm -hmm. is, pa is that paper making process the same, say, in India and different parts of the world? Because um, they have a lot of paper makers. Sure, in of course, India. yes. Um, one thing is a different uh, Japanese paper making, different from other uh, country, is that uh, we do use that uh, uh, a bark of the mulberry trees, which oh. very different from like American uh, or Western papers. It's made out of pulp. So. Um, the method of making papers, of course, is different because the uh, fibers are very different. So it's more uh, complex uh, procedures and uh, about 13 different processes to make one sheet of paper. Is that right? Yes. And then is, does the color change depending on the, the bark? Um, well... Or you change the color? I change the colors, but, um, you know, people think the paper is granted, paper is white, but uh -huh. uh, actually uh, natural fibers are not white. It's like a very yellowish sort uh -huh. of a natural colors, uh -huh. and you know that's what it is. And now you teach paper making. Yes. Mm -hmm. Where do you teach paper making? Um, here in uh, California, I teach at uh, uh, Art Center College of Design uh -huh. in Pasadena and uh, uh, Southern California Institute of Architecture oh. in Los Angeles downtown. Yeah. Sciarc, right? Sciarc, yes. I see. So you actually teach paper making there? Yes. Now, one of the other things mm -hmm. you've shown, you've had art shows mm -hmm. in all over the United States, right. Japan, mm -hmm. Korea. Mm -hmm. uh, do you show paintings or do you show, um, these, these are paper pieces, right. so these are, mm -hmm. these are handmade paper, right? right sure. The sculpture? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've been sculpture? doing this for, since maybe 1989, and uh, I've been continually producing those uh, art pieces, but uh, besides that, I'm a painter, so I do paint and... Uh, so is this handmade paper painted? Uh, yes, this one was, yes. And then it has brush um, Yeah, Let me explain strokes? that just a little okay, bit. Okay, tell us. This paper is that I produce sheet by sheet and then I stock them. And uh, this is about maybe 40 sheets of paper there. I see. And then okay. in a long Switching process, on. yes, you, you can, can see really see that, that uh -huh. layer. and. Um, after I make them and then I start drying them for like a one month or two months. And then after it's completely dry, <laughs> I paint them and then this one was uh, calligraphy on top of it. So is this what you call 
sumi brush, yeah, which sumi, is what you yes. teach as well. Uh, I do teach, yes. Mm -hmm. So when you're at SciArc mm -hmm. or at um, Art Center, Art mm -hmm. Center mm -hmm. in Pasadena, right. you teach tradi traditional Japanese techniques. Yes. In I also teach that uh, Japanese, uh, you know, talking about the uh, uh, aesthetics, aesthetics of the uh, uh, philosophy of the Japanese oh, art. Oh, you do. Yes. So you teach a philosophy class. Mm -hmm. You teach the aesthetics. aesthetics you teach. And uh, traditional casting, casting and um, do you compare them to the Western type of work? Um, well, I think is that um, what I really like to teach students is that maybe when they study Western method of teaching uh, learning uh, things, probably they have a lot of the uh, the textbook showing a lot of examples and things. Mm -hmm. You but mean from Western artists? Western artists, yes. But uh, sort of my sort of a way of teaching is that. I try to teach them the philosophy and more like spiritual sort of uh, idea of what what the making art is about. So uh, Japanese aesthetics, I, I teach them Japanese ma, Japanese uh, wabi sabi. I don't know your term. You know, it's a kind of um, very traditional way of Zen thinking. Do you, so you actually is it an actual class or do you incorporate mm. it with your casting or your sumi oh. painting? Is it all a part of it? Um, sometimes I combine them together. Sometimes I teach them individually. It's, it's time, you know, uh, it's case by case. But uh, most of the time I teach sort of uh, uh, separately. But um, mm. I cover sort of uh, common contents of what I want to teach in uh, each course. So student kind of aware of what what, is. what year would the student be? Would they be beginning or middle or, um, or no, who takes it? Variously. Uh, they can take m my class from different uh, major, you know, sort of uh, uh, sections so that designers, uh, design uh, department, fine arts, um, oh, anyone environmental, in yes, and from um, undergraduate to graduate level, so uh, everybody can take it. It would probably be interesting for architects to take mm -hmm. it if you're if you're talking about the philosophy mm -hmm. and the Zen yes. and the taking away of mm -hmm. things. Yeah, everybody thought that uh, teaching paper making in in Syac, you know, I started eight, uh, 1988, and people thought, well, you're teaching paper making in Syac, and what is the connections? But I always thought that uh, I involved with a lot of uh, stage making, which is oh. scale-wise, it's big and uh, you know and architectural. Architectural, yes. So I just recently did the uh, Japan Expo, um, one of the uh, uh, pavilion that uh, has a big tea room. So where was that? So it's in, in southern part of uh, Kitakyushu city that they held in two thousand. Is that where you were born? Yes. Uh -huh. Say it again. Uh, the Kitakyushu. Name of the Kitakushu. Yeah, right. Um, so you also teach, though, mm. you continue to teach mm. in Japan. Yes. I'm teaching two schools in Tokyo, Tama Art University and Musashino Art University. And so do you go back and forth? Um, my routine sort of uh, thing is that uh, from January through uh, beginning of May, I'm here in Los Angeles all the, all the time. Uh -huh. Then go back to Japan. Mostly I stay there, uh, either in Tokyo or my hometown, Kitakushu, but I go overseas from Japan sometimes, so I'm constantly traveling it a like lot it. of places. You uh, t talked about the stage set that you yes. did for mm -hmm. the Japanese pavilion, mm -hmm. but you also worked with Buto dancers. Yeah, um, 1995, I uh, got acquainted with the uh, uh, Buto dancer. Tell us a little bit what Buto is, because mm. I think it fits into your right. genre, mm. doesn't it? It's sort of hard to explain what the Buto dance is, because it's a kind of uh, um, avant-garde, very contemporary Japanese sort of uh, movement, maybe I can call that dance or movement, movement but yeah. uh, it sort of really depicts the uh, uh, a God and humans. It's in sort of really the connection of the spiritual movement between God and humans. So, and uh, they paint themselves they totally paint them, white? Yeah, white or sometimes black or many different ways. So that you're not dealing with a costume or anything, but you're dealing with your sets, I guess, um, because you do the sets. Yeah, that's the, um, the collaboration between him and me. So I don't re direct his um, you know, movement, but uh, he's sort of inspired by the set. And he danced according to that. Is that right? Yeah, that's So what he waits dance. for you to do the set. Mm -hmm. Is there music involved? Yes. At that time, one of the uh, um, well-known musicians come from China, and uh, so actually three of us sort of uh, 
uh, improvised it and, and, and it's, you know, the place. That sounds fabulous. Mm -hmm. Have you done any other kind of stage work? Um, I mean, more yes. traditional? Mm, more traditional. <laughs> Not Japanese um, traditional, Western traditional. Well, actually, I involved once uh, about a few years ago, we did uh, Medea. It's uh, uh, you know, mm -hmm. um, a, a tragedy. Tra yes. <laughs> a tragedy. I, I made a set. <laughs> Uh, it's all Japanese paper that I made ha handmade, and ah. uh, it's entire sort of a stage. Uh, I made a lot of uh, cloth-like papers hung from the ceilings, and uh, try to sort of uh, uh, make that uh, uh, the shadow to be very so effective. So yeah. So there like wasn't that. much furniture, just this m yeah. more uh, banners hanging. Exactly. Yes, something like that. And I did many different kinds of concert. Um, Classical uh, piano concert. I made stage and um, oh, you wouldn't think about that yeah, with the concert something with like the pianist. That. Yeah. yeah, music. I, I I've done a lot. With Before the, we leave, I want mm. to talk about this okay. collage that okay. you've done here. Maybe you can because mm -hmm. it's it's parts of your painting right. and parts mm. of your. This uh, is my uh, recent sort of uh, um, the style of the painting that I've been uh, showing uh, in many places. So this black area is like a sumi painting. So mm -hmm. I use a sumi stroke, bright stroke to do uh, painting. And these are all handmade paper that uh, most of them I make and some that uh, I'd not be able to make because of the machine. I specifically ask somebody else to produce for me. So this is a collage piece of each section that uh, I put them together oh, to make uh, work like this. It's really incredible. And it's not only the painting mm. that you did, but right. it's also you made it from the bottom up. Right. I, this is sort of my uh, uh, always the dreams that uh, I make everything from my own sort of hands and, uh, um, you know. So would this be a series? Yes. Uh, that you did, and yes. is this there is a name? title called that uh, "Gather Dreams," which I've been sort of uh, having a lot of, you know, image and imagination. So it's already had like a 50 uh, gather dreams that I produced already, and then it's going on from oh, the so future. Oh, so it's like, do you uh, you wake up in the morning and say, "This is what I was dreaming," and you? Well, not I exactly the <laughs> dreaming, but uh, sort of because I'm always thinking about my my art and uh, those sort of uh, landscape like uh -huh. uh, 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 things. Uh, it's like my sort of you know um, childhood to today is that I'm always adoring it. So. Oh. I loved having you today, thank Yoshiko. You so much. Thank I'm you so here. much, Thanks and thank so much. you for bringing this. And thank you for watching us on the Joan Quinn Profiles. And Yoshio Ikazaki will be in Los Angeles for six months now. Yes, yes. Keep riding to 777 South Figueroa, 44th floor, Los Angeles, 917. And we'll see you next time on the Joan Quinn Profiles.